All right, I, I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. Um, my voice might seem louder because I realized that my microphone was covered up in the previous couple of videos. So hopefully your audio will be a little better now. Um, all right, so let's get back to work here. Uh, we've looked at the limit of a function and now we're going to look at uh, how we calculate limits. So uh, only a couple of notes here. A lot of this is gonna be done in class, but we need to set up some laws and some rules before we begin. So up to this point, uh, we've only been able to look at uh, graphs to determine limits. Um, and so, you know, if I supply you with a graph, <clears throat> of course, it, it becomes somewhat easy for you to figure out a limit. Um, we really are going to be wanting to do these things by hand by analyzing the function itself without the graph. And this is going to require a significant amount of algebra and some tricks. All right. So, uh, a lot of this that I do in class, you're going to be having to keep note of these little algebra things I'm doing to calculate these things. Um, when we do this, we're going to be using a couple of limit laws. Uh, here they are. Uh, first thing we need to uh, assume is that C is a constant, so it's we have some number, and that the limit of the function F as X approaches A and the limit of the function G as X approaches A both exist. That means that as you approach A from the left and right, you get some answer. And as you approach A from the left and right for this G function, you get some answer. Remember, for a limit not to exist, we'd say does not exist, if the limit from the left and the right were not the same. So we are assuming that C is a constant and that these limits exist. So from the left and right, they are the same for each of the two functions. If that's true, then here's what the limits laws say. The limit as x approaches a of the sum of those two functions is just the sum of the two limits individually. So you can almost look at this as like distribution. The limit can go um, in front of this function and in front of that function, and then you just add the results. So we say the limit of a sum, that's the limit of a sum, is equal to the sum, here's the sum, of the two limits. And it works the same for subtraction. The limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. Just make sure you get the order correct here. If this is f minus g, then the limit here is f minus g. If we take the limit of a constant times a function, we can take that constant and take it out of the limit and put it in front, which means that the constant has no effect on the function. We'll just find the limit of the function itself and then multiply by the constant at the end. Also, the limit of a product of two functions is equal to the product of the limit. So again, the limit can pass through and be applied to each of the two functions being multiplied. Then it works the same for the quotient. If you have division of two functions, then you can take the limit on the top and the bottom separately, so long as the denominator's limit does not go to zero, because if the denominator's limit goes to zero, then you get undefined. At this point, we're actually gonna have a way of dealing with that, but for now, um, this is the law so long as the bottom doesn't go to zero. Also, if you have the limit of a function being raised to a power, what you can do is take the limit of the function, figure out what that is, and then raise it to the power after you take the limit of the function. So this basically says that the limit can go inside of a power. Uh, these are, these are uh, important. Number seven, the limit as x approaches a of a constant is equal to the constant. And that's because if this is a constant function, it does not matter. It's like a flat line. It does not matter from the left or right or anything. Um, all that matters is that the function remains the same the whole time, so the limit will be equal to whatever the value of the function is. Uh, the limit as x approaches a of x is a. Well, that's because you're letting x get close to a. So what happens here? Well, x becomes a, so the limit is a. The limit as x approaches a of x to the n is a to the n for the same reason as up here. If x is going to a, then this guy right here is going to a, so the answer should be a to the n. The limit of the square root of x as x approaches a is also the square root of a. So that value in there, x is getting close to a, so the answer should be root a, or it should be approaching root a. This is an interesting uh, property here. It says that uh, you take the limit as x approaches a of the nth root of some function that you can pass the limit inside the root, take the limit of the function, and then take that answer and take the nth root. So those are the limit laws. Um, <clears throat> we also have 
what's called the dis direct substitution properly property. Um, so before I actually go into this, I need to tell you a couple of things. Um, something about what's called the implied domain of a function. If somebody gives you a function, the implied domain is the set of values which may be plugged into the function without causing the function to be undefined. So for example, if I give you the function f of x um, equals root x over um, x minus 4, the implied domain is this set of all x's, all real numbers, all x's in the real numbers such that the following two conditions are met. First of all, x has to be greater than zero. Why? Because the square root of a number, um, I'm sorry, this should be greater than or equal to zero because you cannot take the square root of a negative number. Therefore, um, you can't, your x values have to be greater than or equal to zero for you to even be able to plug it in. So that's the first part and you need that x can't be 4 because if you plug 4 into x for the denominator you get 4 minus 4 which is 0 division by 0 is undefined so we our domain is any x bigger than or equal to 0 but also not 4 so that's the implied domain if someone gives you this function you need to know that that's the that the domain of it is this okay now the direct substitution property it says First of all, if f is a polynomial function, a rational function, a trigonometric function, an exponential function, or a logarithmic function, any of those functions, then as long as a is in the implied domain then of the function, we have the following. The limit of the function as x approaches a is just simply plugging a into the function. So as long as, as, long as the a that we're approaching lives in the domain of any of these types of functions. The answer is just plugging that value into the function. There's no real work to be done here. But you must make sure that that A is in the domain of, of the functions. Uh, again, we'll see this with some examples. So then in class, I will do uh, these examples here. Um, and then we have two very important limits that we need to know. Um, I'll actually try and show these in class why they are this. but. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equals 1. Every calculus student should know this. Also, the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine of x minus 1 equals, or over x equals 0. So think about what's happening here. Sine of x over x, as you plug in 0, as you approach 0, you get 0 on top and bottom. So you get undefined at 0. But as we approach 0, we get closer to 1. We actually looked at this graph. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, it was in here. This was it right here. Um, sine of x over x. We looked at it as you approach from the left and from the right. It was getting closer to 1. Of course, at 0, it was undefined. But see, that's the function we're looking at. Everyone needs to know that as you approach 0, you, um, you get 1. This one we didn't look at um, a graph, but let's just look at what's happening here. As x approaches 0, cosine of 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. And on the bottom, we're plugging in zero. So you get zero over zero again. At zero, it's undefined. But as you get closer to it, you get zero. So I will show you the, these in class. I'll try and explain why these are true. And then um, in class, I will do these examples from page 45.